Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. So, as you can probably tell, I've been gathering X670 slash X670E motherboards. And I've been doing that for a few months now. This, this content has been quite a few months in the making. Lots of motherboards. Uh, I think 22 in total. So, countless hours of testing, setting up, building systems, taking apart. It's been a lot of work. But I've been doing it so we can look at stuff like VRM Thermal Performance to see if all of these boards can handle the Ryzen 9 at 7950X without any kind of thermal throttling issues. And that's something we ran into with a number of X570 motherboards just a few years ago now. As I've noted, this took a tremendous amount of work, tremendous amount of time. Uh, apologies to those of you who have been requesting this content nonstop over the last few months, but I've done it as quickly as I could amongst all the other product releases we've had. Anyway. On hand, we have pretty much every single X670 slash X670E motherboard. All said and done, I've tested 22 boards, uh, four from ASRock, four from Gigabyte, four from MSI, and then 10 from ASUS. Uh, not sure why ASUS have so many more boards than the other three brands. Who knows? I'm not, maybe the question is why the other three brands have so few boards. Not sure what the situation is, but we have a lot to go over. ASUS is the only brand to offer a mini ITX X670E board, and they're also the only brand to offer a micro ATX X670E board. So that means we have one mini ITX, one micro ATX, and 20 ATX boards on hand for testing. Now, normally I would go over each board individually, talk about the key features, the heat sinks, the VRM components, all that sort of stuff, but we do have 22 boards, so spending a few minutes on each one just really isn't going to be feasible for this video. So what we'll do is we'll quickly jump into the VRM thermal testing, then brush over some specs in a comparison table before making some board recommendations. So let's get into it. Okay, so first let's talk about the test conditions. For this testing, I've built a dedicated system inside the Corsair IQ 7000X case, and pairing we have the HX1000 power supply, and then for cooling the Corsair IQ H170i Elite Capelix. The IQ7000X has been configured with a single rear 140mm exhaust fan and three 140mm intake fans, so the stock configuration for this case. Then in the top we have the H170i 420mm radiator with three 140mm exhaust fans. This is a pretty high end configuration, airflow is good, and in a 21 degree room I'd say this is an optimal setup. For recording temperatures, I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples, and I'm reporting the peak rear PCB temperature. Finally, I'm not reporting delta T over ambient, instead I maintain a room temperature of 21 degrees, and to ensure a consistent ambient temperature, a thermocouple is positioned next to the test system. Now, normally I'd test a range of CPUs to see how the boards handle varying loads, but with all X670 boards bordering on extreme overkill when it comes to their VRM design, I've just used the Ryzen 9 7950X for all of the testing. As for the stress test, I will be using Cinebench R23, which has been looped for an hour, at which point I'm reporting the maximum PCB temperature, again recorded using K-type thermocouples. Okay, so the good news is you don't have to worry about VRM thermals with X670 motherboards, not even a little bit. In the past, we've seen boards that should perform fairly well fail miserably in this testing, but that is certainly not the case here. Now, a few things to note though, any temperature below 80 degrees is to be considered very cool. And this is because VRM temperatures really only start to become a concern when they exceed 90 degrees. And even then, there's still 10 to 20 degrees worth of headroom before most boards will thermal throttle. Below 80 degrees is very safe and will never present an issue, so all X670 boards are well within safe limits. I should also stress that there's really no difference between a board running at say 56 degrees and then one at 67 or even 76 degrees. Performance will be identical assuming the same operating parameters, so frequency and timings. Therefore you wouldn't necessarily purchase say the Aorus Master over the Tai Chi because the Gigabytes board VRM ran at 4 degrees cooler. You would buy whichever one of these boards offers you the best price and features because the VRM thermals are now irrelevant. That said, if two products do occupy the same price point, but one runs significantly cooler than the other, that could be reason to buy one over the other. For example, the Gigabyte X670 E Aorus Elite AX, that ran at just 57 degrees, and at $290, shares the same price tag as the ASUS Prime X670 P Wi-Fi, which did still run at a very satisfactory 66 degrees, but that is a lot warmer than what we saw with the Gigabyte boards. So if all else is equal, then I'd recommend the Aorus Elite AX. 
Also, for those of you wondering why I didn't bother overclocking the 7950X to increase the VRAM load further, I didn't bother because it's a bit pointless. All boards will easily handle any overclock 7950X, and really, most of you are probably far more interested in undervolting AM5 processors than you are overclocking. So all said and done, VRAM thermals are not a concern for X670 shoppers, and based on the results here, should be deprioritized. Instead, potential buyers should focus on the price and of course features, so let's go do that. For those of you looking at spending $300 or less on an X670 board, there are over half a dozen options, the cheapest of which is the ASRock X670E PG Lightning, and it also happens to be an X670 Extreme motherboard. As far as entry-level X670 motherboards go, the ASRock X670E PG Lightning and Gigabyte X670 Gaming X are, in my opinion, the best options. MSI's Pro X670 Dash PY Wi-Fi, it's also a decent board, though it doesn't really do anything to justify the price premium over the Gaming X. The MSI board is also priced to compete with ASRock's X670E Pro RS, which is another extreme board offering PCI Express 5.0 to the primary PCIe slot, along with the primary M.2 slot. You also get a pre-installed I.O. shield with the Pro RS and an upgradable M.2 Wi-Fi 6E module. The MSI board has a better VRM on paper, but in reality just a degree Celsius separated them with the 7950X. Then from $300 to $350, there are three options from ASUS and ASRock. The ASRock X670E Steel Legend, that comes in at $300, and then we have the ASUS Tough Gaming X670E Dash Plus Wi Fi at $330, and the ASUS Prime X670E Dash Pro Wi Fi at $350. The Tough Gaming and Prime are basically the same product. The Prime just gets an extra M.2 heatsink, onboard buttons for power and reset, an easy to access release for the PCIe retention mechanism, and better RGB lighting. Hard to say if all of that's worth the extra $20, though. In terms of value, the Steel Legend offers basically everything you'll find on the Tough Gaming, so at $30 US, it's a good deal, and at a $50 saving from the Prime Pro, it's probably the better option here as well. So unless ASUS can get the Prime Pro within $20 of the Steel Legend, I'd just go with the ASRock board. From there, pricing jumps up to $420 for the ASUS ROG Strix X670E-A Gaming, $440 for the ASUS ROG Strix X670E-F Gaming, and then $480 for the MSI MPG X670E Carbon. There's also the $460 ASUS ROG Strix X670E Dash I Gaming, but that's an ITX board, and it is the only X670E ITX board on the market, so I guess if you want an ITX board with AMD's flagship chipset, then it really goes without saying you'd buy this ASUS model. The ROG Strix X670E Dash I Gaming, though, it is a very impressive ITX motherboard using 10 110 amp power stages for the V core. It ran very cool, and although it features active cooling, it was always very quiet in our testing. Admittedly, though, I did test it under the same conditions as all other boards, so in a cramped ITX case, it will likely run a little bit hotter than what we're showing here, but I am confident that it's up to the task. You also get USB 4 support, 10 ports on the IO panel high quality external audio, two M.2 ports, 2.5 gigabit LAN and Wi-Fi 6E. So it's a super well equipped ITX motherboard, but of course it's not exactly cheap. As for the Strix X670E-A and Strix X670E-F, these are essentially the same motherboards with just different styling. The F is an all black design, so very stealthy looking, while the A features a lot of white and silver elements, mostly on the motherboard's heat sinks. So in terms of pricing, the A, which costs $20 less, is the best value option here. But if you want that stealthy look, then you'll have to cough up the extra dough for the F. Alternatively, there's the MSI X670E Carbon, which costs even more at $480. And the main reason for spending more on this board is to receive PCIe 5.0 support for the primary and secondary PCIe x 16 slots along with the primary and secondary M.2 slots. Of course, when using both of these devices, the bandwidth is halved, which isn't an issue when using PCIe 5.0 hardware, but it is a little bit of a problem for PCIe 4.0 devices. Still, if you were to use PCIe Express 5.0 devices, this configuration would make the most sense, as both devices would receive times 8 PCIe 5.0 bandwidth, which is 32 gigabytes per second. In comparison, the ASUS ROG Strix X670E F Gaming connects its secondary PCIe x 16 slot to the chipset, which is a lot cheaper to wire in, 
but it does limit you to PCIe 4.0 times 4 bandwidth, so just 8 gigabytes per second of bandwidth there for the secondary slot. Essentially, both boards have roughly the same amount of PCIe bandwidth. The Carbon just does a better job of spreading the bandwidth across multiple slots, while almost 90% of the PCIe bandwidth of the F Gaming is eaten up by the primary PCIe 5.0 times 16 slot. So therefore, I guess you could argue that the Carbon is a more future-proof motherboard that will support future generations of AM5 hardware better, but whether or not that's worth paying a $40 to $60 US premium for right now, well, it's hard to say, but it is the most affordable X670E motherboard to offer this configuration. That said, the ASUS ROG Strix X670E-E Gaming is only $20 more. It offers the same PCIe configuration, an extra PCIe 5.0 M.2 slot, and more USB 3.2 ports. So let's take a look at the next price range, which does start at $500, and that opens you up to not just the ASUS ROG Strix X670E-E Gaming, but also the Gigabyte X670E Aorus Master and ASRock X670E Tai Chi. There's also the ASUS ROG Crosshair X670E Gene for $510, but that's a micro ATX board. It's the only micro ATX X670 board, so like the ITX version, it kind of just wins by default if you want a micro ATX X670 motherboard, and of course it is a X670E version. And it's an extreme motherboard in more ways than one. The 16 teamed 110 amp power stages for the vCore VRM are no joke. There's two PCIe 5.0 M.2 slots, USB 4 support, loads of USB ports, onboard buttons, debug LED code, 2.5 gigabit LAN, and Wi-Fi 6. It's an impressive, but also ultra expensive MATX motherboard. As for the other three options, I think the least impressive is the X670E Aorus Master, at $500, it's really not a significant upgrade over the Aorus Elite AX, despite costing a little over 70% more, which is obviously a very significant cost increase. Of course, it is an X670 Extreme board, so you do get PCIe 5.0 for the primary PCIe slot, so that's nice. There's also a second PCIe 5.0 M.2 slot, and the VRM has been upgraded with 105 amp power stages from the 60 amp models used by the Aorus Elite, but really, that's going to be of benefit to very few users. Perhaps a much bigger problem for the Aorus Master is the fact that for the same price, the ASUS ROG Strix X670E-E Gaming and ASRock X670E Tai Chi are just better equipped. For one, both boards wire in their primary and secondary PCI x 16 slots to the CPU for PCIe 5.0 bandwidth. The E Gaming is the most affordable X670E motherboard to provide three PCIe 5.0 enabled M.2 slots, while the Tai Chi supports USB 4 and 8 SATA ports. Frankly, picking between the ASUS ROG Strix X670E-E Gaming and ASRock X670E Tai Chi is very difficult. They're both excellent boards, albeit mighty expensive at $500, but they're equally good in my opinion. Now in the $700-ish price range, we have the ASUS ROG Crosshair X670E Hero at $680, and the MSI Meg X670E Ace and Gigabyte X670E Aorus Extreme at $700. The Aorus Extreme kind of suffers the same fate as the Aorus Master, it just doesn't do anything special to justify the price. It's certainly a very nice motherboard, but the competing MSI and ASUS boards just offer more. For some reason, Gigabyte spent their PCIe 5.0 budget on M.2 drives, limiting PCIe support to a single time 16 slot. So while I guess four PCIe 5.0 M.2 slots are nice, I'd rather have the flexibility of having more PCIe slots. The Crosshair Hero, for example, offers two PCIe 5.0x16 slots, with two onboard PCIe 5.0M.2s, as well as a single PCIe 5.0 expansion card supporting an additional M.2 slot. Meanwhile, the MSI Ace, that packs an impressive three PCIe 5.0x16 slots, capable of a PCIe 5.0x8x8x4 configuration, and a single onboard PCIe 5.0M.2 slot, along with a PCIe 5.0 expansion card supporting an additional M.2 slots, providing half a dozen M.2s in total. The Ace also packs a possible 17 USB 3.2 ports, while the Crosshair Hero provides USB 4 support. For me though, the fact that you get 10 gigabit LAN with the Ace is a nice bonus, and although the Aorus Extreme also includes 10 gigabit LAN, it falls short when it comes to USB and PCIe support in my opinion. So of these $700 boards, I believe the MSI Meg X670E Ace is the best option here thanks to its superior PCIe configuration 
M.2 support, USB support when compared to the Aorus Extreme, and network support when compared to the Crosshair Hero. Then finally we have the super stupid expensive motherboards, the ASUS ROG Crosshair X670E Extreme at $1000, and the we don't care at all at this point MSI Meg X670E Godlike at $1300. So if for some reason $700 US isn't crazy enough for an AM5 motherboard, ASUS and MSI have you covered. The Godlike is really an awesome looking motherboard, but I'm not really sure what it offers over the ACE, other than the fact that it's, yeah, a really awesome looking motherboard with a couple of nice features. It costs $500 more, so that's an 86% price hike, and I'm just not exactly sure why, other than, yeah, like I said, it, it kind of looks cool. The I.O. panel features one less USB Type-C and one less Type-A, and for that trade-off it picks up 2.5 gigabit LAN in addition to the 10 gigabit LAN. Other than that though, the PCIe and M.2 configuration is the same, so that is to say very good, but it is the same as the $700 MSI board. The only real difference between the Ace and Godlike is the VRM, and the Ace already packs a stupid overkill VRM. That being the case, I'm not really sure what to say about the Godlike's 24 105 amp power stage vCore. I'm not quite sure why this board has enough power delivery for about half a dozen Ryzen 9 processors, but it does. The Godlike also really isn't worth the $300 premium it commands over the Crosshair Extreme, but then it's not worth the $600 premium it commands over the Ace. Likewise, the Crosshair Extreme isn't worth the $300 over the Ace either. At the end of the day though, if you want the most extreme X670E motherboard for the sake of bragging rights or whatever, either of these motherboards will work. They're equally ridiculous, you could say. Well, there you have it. VRM thermals for basically every X670 slash X670E motherboard on the market, along with my own personal breakdown and recommendations at each price point. And in fact, let's quickly recap my picks so I can say X670 or X670E another thousand times. Apologies for that. That's just sort of the way it is. The best value X670E boards include the ASRock X670E PG Lightning and Gigabyte X670 Gaming X, along with the ASRock X670E Pro RS and ASRock X670E Steel Legend. The best mid-range options, which sadly cost around $500 US, include the MSI MPG X670E Carbon Wi-Fi and ASUS ROG Strix X670E-E Gaming. Both are equally good, along with the ASRock X670E Tai Chi. Also in the same price range is the ASUS ROG Strix X670E-I Gaming Wi-Fi, which wins the award for the best X670E Mini ITX motherboard by default, as it's the only option. And then we have the ASUS ROG Crosshair X670E Gene, which does the same for the best micro ATX motherboard. Again, it's the only MATX model. Then for the best high-end X670E motherboard, it's quite simply the MSI Meg X670E Ace. The stupid expensive ASUS ROG Crosshair X670E Extreme and MSI Meg X670E Godlike are of course excellent motherboards, I just can't justify the asking prices, especially in the case of the Godlike. At the end of the day, the good news being that there are no bad x670 slash x670E motherboards. I sure prices might be a bit hard to swallow, or really very hard to swallow, but there are no duds at least, and that's a pretty rare thing when reviewing an entire motherboard series, and something we've been trying to do for a while now. So I really hope you found this content useful, and expect similar content covering the B650 boards. We'll also have some Intel motherboard roundups coming up soon as well, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of B650 boards, and I do plan to cover pretty well all of them again, so I think it's almost twice what you're seeing here. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. Hope you enjoyed the the or appreciate the time and effort that went into this one. I guess enjoyed the content, and hopefully it was useful for those of you buying one of these motherboards. I won't say the chipset name. Uh, if, it, if it was useful, please do like, subscribe, because there's more AM5 motherboard and Intel motherboard content to come up. Uh, we also have Float Plan and Patreon if you'd like to support our work and get some cool perks in return. We have a, a members Discord channel. We have a members live stream. Tim and myself get together and do that once a month. We have Q&A stuff, behind the scenes content, a lot of cool stuff there. So check it out if you're interested. But if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this content. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time. <laughs>